Hello again. This is John Cronin, hosting Invent Anything. For over 20 years, I've been the managing director of IP Capital Group, which is an intellectual property group and innovation consultancy that serves thousands of clients, including 15% of the Fortune 500. I'm also a co-inventor of hundreds of patents with my company and my previous work when I was at IBM. This series of Invent Anything episodes were created to relay our decades of experience in inventing anything, using creativity, invention, innovation, and patents, and all the fine processes and strategies to make this world up. We apply these episodes, we hope, to a wide audience with our experiences and working with thousands of real clients, from startups to so many Fortune 500 companies working on simple consumer products to quantum computers. We have a combination a blog series called Invent Anything, where we look at current events through the lens of Invent Anything, and that can be found through the link below. But in this episode, we're going to cover what is a patent and what can it do for you. you this won't be boring legal analysis with some sort of patent 101 explanation as we hope to breathe life into a patent and to tackle where it all started, how it has been used and how it will be used, especially in the future, maybe with AI. So today we'll cover six topics. The first topic we'll cover is the history of patents, which gives us a solid foundation. We can see the many changes that have occurred over the many, many hundreds of years. We'll then talk about what a patent is and what a patent and why a patent is a negative right in topic two. Uh, here we'll actually talk about you know, where it all started in our constitution. We'll talk about what a patent is not. You'd be surprised to find out that a patent doesn't give you the rights that you think you might uh, get. We'll also talk about what a patent can do for you, some positives of a patent. But also in topic five, we'll talk about what a patent can do for you in terms of what the process does through the patent process and how that gives you insight. And in topic six, we'll talk about the future of patents and then, as usual, we'll wrap up. But as we begin, we want to talk about the audience for this. So this is a great episode for those not really familiar with patents or need to have a quick refresher. It will give you the detailed insights you need. It might be also very good for those who like to learn about patents from a wide scope of both history and where the future is headed. There are those folks in the audience that might be from management or supervisory levels that may want to get a briefer on what is a patent and what is it good for. It may be good for those who want to understand the connection between patents and leveraging business. I talk to so many investors and venture capitalists in private equity almost weekly to talk about this value of patents and how it can help the business. So you might be interested in what, a, what is a patent and what it can do for you. In the previous episode, we talked about a very important point called enablement, and that's required to get the patent. But so you also need to have novelty from the prior art. So assuming that you know how to enable it and it's novel, uh, you can get a patent. So let's discuss what is a patent and what can it do for you. So in our first topic, what is a patent and the history of patents, we should talk about the very early days of basically power. If you sort of think about in a very simplified way that very early on in mankind's career, I guess, that might was right. And then money started being added to this sort of commerce and those that won that game had might. And now what happens is with patents come into play where ideas to create money can then create power. So from the early days of really arm wrestling to today's super rich, patents have this very unique uh, right. It stand, stands alone as a way to own an idea. And by owning an idea, you can own industries. So patent is very important. In our second point of our first topic here, what is a patent in the history of patents, uh, we see that early on the protection of ideas started in the feudal system and guilds. The king or the lord wanted innovation to occur because that would be good for their kingdom. So what happened is in order to incent that behavior, in this case, having new skills or really good skills, the king could provide you protection and provide you maybe the ability to make more money because he wanted the shoemakers, he wanted the leather makers, he wanted the saddle makers to produce the best saddles in his kingdom. Historically, patent rights were recognized as far back as ancient Greece, even as far back as 500 BCE, where this term exclusive rights were granted for only one year for things like new recipes. Later in England in the 1300s, patents were issued by the kings to inventors to improve new industries. This led to a 20-year term which exists today. We start to see patents used in countries like Venice in 1416, 
and the patent terms for some types of patents was three years back then. Interestingly, patents are a negative right in our Constitution to quote-unquote give the inventor its due. The United States Constitution gave the power to Congress to create laws pertaining to patents. And under Article 1, Section 8, it reads, quote, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. So this idea of exclusivity, once again, even in our Constitution. The U.S. Patent Office really started by the Patent Act in 1790, and this gave the power to grant or refuse patents to the Secretary of State or the Secretary of War and the Attorney General. Later, this uh, moved to a patent office and a patent system because these people were very busy running the country and their lives. Patent applications needed to have enough of a two out of the three to get a patent that this uh, proved almost impossible. This examination process was so criticized that it did lead to the granting of patents to a patent office. The first patent was in Potash. A gentleman by the name of Samuel Hopkins in 1790 was granted the first U.S. patent under the U.S. Patent Statute and was signed by President Washington. Hopkins really petitioned the patent office in a way of uh, making potash or pearl ash by a new apparatus and process. Potash is basically used in things like soaps and animal feeds and things like that. I actually have a copy of this uh, one paragraph long patent in, in order to show how simple the process was back then. Boy, what's needed in the patent system to go from that potash single paragraph patent to, to what I just showed you in the enablement of a cardboard box that required dozens of figures and dozens of pages to describe enablement. Back in the 1790s, all you had to do was write a paragraph. The last patent office we've seen kind of spring up was one in China in 1985, uh, where they created their own patent system. So patent offices are uh, not only historical, they become recent events. And also the patent offices have changes in laws and changes in processes. Even as recently as 2020, about 50% of all the patents filed in China were held to be wrongly filed. So patent offices, you know, are just offices like anything else, and they can grow and change and make mistakes. Let's talk about topic two. What is a patent and why is a patent a negative right? Well, the first thing to know is a patent allows you the ability to stop others from make, using, or selling. It's a way that if someone makes your invention or uses it or sells it, that you can stop them. Uh, you'd have to take them to court or request a license maybe first, and if they don't take them to court, when you take them to court, the patent system is there where there's laws associated with what is a patent and what right does it have. Literally, it can stop the other person from make, using, or selling. One of the things to know is that patents really protect the individual in the country the patent is obtained. So think about it like a dome. If you have a U.S. patent, this make, use, or sell has only to do what happens in that dome. So if you have a patent in the U.S., it doesn't give you the right to do anything if the patent is used in, say, England. So patents are really protected in the country that it's granted in. Also note that patents protect you for a period of time. Today, in fact, it's 20 years from the date you file. And, and after that, the patent becomes public domain. There are other vehicles for intellectual property like trade secrets or uh, trade names and things. They last far longer. So a patent has a very short window of time. But however, 20 years today is a lifetime when it comes to technology. One of the things to know is the inventor is the person who obtained the patent and they can assign it to anybody else. Earlier on, I talked about how a dry erase marker could be designed and made by an inventor who could you know, bring to bear somebody else who would help him make that. As long as he gave the directions for how to make that dry erase marker, then he is the inventor, not the person who actually worked for hire to make the dry erase marker. And it's not your manager. So the inventor is the person that files the patent. Today, in fact, in order to obtain a patent, you have to be a human being. I say that sort of tongue in cheek. Uh, because now there's technology that allows one to use AI to create a patent. There is this technology called generative adversarial networks, which are a bunch of machines that basically have two neural networks where one is informing the other about what what is good and what is bad, and together they formulate new invention. And so the idea here of a human being to be the inventor is still the way it is, but maybe in the future uh, AI can invent as it turns out, the Dabas case by Dr. Teller, uh, both the U.S. and the European Patent Office said they still viewed that a human was required to be the inventor. In order to be an inventor, you actually have to sign a document called the Oath of Declaration. But this is interesting. The Oath of Declaration is actually saying you believe yourself to be the inventor and you believe yourself to be the inventor of something that's novel. 
that you've looked at the prior art, and to your knowledge, you're not copying anybody. So the oath of declaration is a consent between you and the patent office that what you're saying is true. Patents can be taken away from you if you violate that oath. It's kind of like the stoplight at the toll booth. If you go through the toll booth and don't pay, they don't get you for not paying. They get you for going through the stoplight. And I did talk about the inventor once again being a human and the inventor being the author, but the inventor is not necessarily the patent owner. You could work for a company and invent something, and the company basically owns the rights and would pay for the patent and pay for your contribution, but they would own the patent. So you see the difference between sort of the inventor and the patent owner. Many times they're the same, but many times they're not. There's also this idea of many inventors in one patent, and that's a paradigm. Because if you have you and your buddy, and you both have become uh, on the same patent, it might surprise you that your buddy has the same rights as you do. So they can go off and separately license it uh, without your knowledge. They can't sell it, but they could license it. There have been many patent cases trialed where they brought in the other inventor, your buddy, that provided the rights to the infringement. You were very surprised that you thought you could stop somebody. So be very careful as to how you pick your buddies and, and patent together and make sure you have that all ironed out through legal documentation before you file the patent about how the ownership is going to go. And I did say that the patent owner, outside of being a human and should be the author and signs the oath of declaration, the enforcer of the patent really is the patent owner, not the inventor. The inventor could be the patent owner. So it's up to you. It's up to the patent owner to figure out who is violating it. There is no system other than you, the owner of the patent, to find the violators. So again, this allows you to stop others from making, using, or selling. And you do that through the acts of litigation, licensing, force of a seal, and there are myriads of other uses. So let's jump on to uh, topic number three, what a patent is not. So patent's not a trade name. Th that's the name that you might get for 75 years for a business or a particular product like Apple or, or uh, Peppermint or something or Lifesavers. These are names. They're, they're not patents. They're trade names. But they're, the name certainly can be pr a protected device for the patent office. It's not a copyright. Copyrights protect the right for somebody to copy you. And there's three different parts of a copyright, just the general copyright, that you can prove it was your work and people copied it and you can stop them from using it. You can get very formal about this to actually pay a fee to the patent office and file your information as a copyright so it's on record that it's definitely yours. Another form of intellectual property the patent is not is a trade secret. So you take the formula for Coca-Cola. They didn't patent that because formula it can't be reverse engineered. So trade secrets are another form of intellectual property of which a patent is not. If you sort of think about trade secrets in another level here, trade secrets, the only way they're guarded is by how well you can hide them. So today you see cybersecurity and blockchain being the way that people want to hide trade secrets. And here's a surprising fact of what a patent doesn't give you. A patent doesn't give you the right to make users sell your own invention. What the heck? Yeah, you heard it. That's right. You can stop others from make using or selling but you can not necessarily own the right to make use or sell your own invention. And the reason behind that is kind of practical. It turns out your invention, your patent, may require the use of other patents underneath it. So if you don't have those patent rights, you don't necessarily have the right yourself. So don't walk into a patent thinking once you've got it that you're guaranteed to develop your product and, and that you can't be sued. That's absolutely not true. The only thing that you can do with your patent is to sue others. And a patent may or may not be guaranteed. Uh, it used to be that a patent was guaranteed and only invalidated in court. Today, there's a separate board in the patent office called the PTAB where they could be asked to re-review your patent and basically find out that it's not novel and to basically make your patent not valid. We'll see what happens uh, in June of this year. The Supreme Court has actually taken this case up. But a patent, if you get it, is not necessarily guaranteed. So let's go to topic four, what a patent can do for you, some positives of a patent. Well, the first thing, and really kind of fun, is that a patent proves that you're the inventor. You were there first. I can't tell you how many times that I've dealt with inventors, and that becomes the single ego reason that they want to get a patent, to show that they were first. I think it's a great reason, by the way, but it is something more about you. But companies tend to do it to show that they were the innovator, right? Examiners become the judge of this, and it's helpful because you're not the judge of the patent and the novelty. The examiner is, and that's a third party. So to get a patent is a really big deal. Another thing about patents is it can stop copycats. There's been studies to show that a patent-protected product can improve the margins by about 34% over a non-patent-protected product. One of the interesting things about a patent is if you get it for your product, uh, you won't find competitors calling you up and saying, hey, this is great, you got the patent, I can't copy your good work. 
You'll never get anything like that, but you should see the value of your patent differentiating your product in the market. There is this thing called the patent multiplier effect. That is, you file a patent, but that one patent could become 10 or 20, 30 other patents because you can have multiple continuations or divisionals. Continuations are ways to say that I didn't just patent A and B, I patent this further thing, this improvement C, based upon A and B. And that is used a lot in business to basically get the claims of a first type of patent and then figure out where the market heads. Hopefully, if everything's in your spec in the enablement we talked about, you can get more patents on your first and patent. I'll do a series on this uh, later on uh, because there's a very powerful notion that one patent has this multiplier effect. There's some great examples of the use of patents and one of the old uses was called, quote, submarine patents. But Jerome Lemelson was sort of the largest case of this. He kept extending his patents and have them read on new technologies. And so by doing this, Jerome Lemelson patents had made him billions of dollars because back then the patent system would allow you to extend a patent uh, forever, basically, through this process of uh, keep changing the technologies to deal with the future technologies. And that's why today we have a 20-year patent term, which totally eliminates the submarine patents. The other thing about patents, which is kind of interesting, it's a little aside, is that when you file a patent, nobody will know that your patent is filed until 18 months. In other words, it's held private. So you can put the patent in and nobody else will know it. And then later on, it will be laid open, particularly when it issues. If you decide to lay it open, you can, but you can keep it hidden. And that creates this sort of black cloud that makes it hard to deal with strategy, trying to figure out what the other company has for patents. And as I mentioned, Patents are a badge of honor. They can't take it away from you. I don't know how many engineers and technical people have talked at companies that would say, look, one reason why you should get patents is because it goes on your resume. That's about you. It's not about your company. And I can't tell you how many inventors, and some that one of my recent friends has over 100 patents that we've helped him with. And that certainly is helping him to find a new job. So I can tell you that it's a great badge of honor. Many of my friends are inventors and getting a patent is a very big deal, as I mentioned. But to investors, this is really good because patents can help you value the company. But keep in mind, some investors really love patents and some don't. So if you want to get value in your company based upon patents, make sure you're talking to investors that, that think patents are valuable. Because I've talked to a lot of investors that think it's just the cost and it's an annoyance. The company, they think patents could be very useful because they can raise the company's valuation. When a company gets acquired, for instance, they usually get acquired for multiples of revenue, maybe one and a half to two X revenue. There have been companies that have been valued and purchased at 200x revenue, and that's basically because of the patents. And there appears to be, from the best indication of our studies, is around 15 patents is the place where you have enough patents where it's almost impossible to invent around where the value really soars. The stock market also gives value to patents, particularly drug companies, so people price in the value of a company in terms of the patents. And finally, cash. That's great because you can make cash in a litigation or a license, one of the Companies that we represented for a number of years, Vernetics, actually has now completed its second large litigation, of which it's making over $500 million. And, and patents are used by some very interesting business models like non-practicing entities that just own patents and sue people or license, but they don't have any products, so they can't be counted sued. So let's go to topic five, what a patent could do for you. The patent process gives you insight. A few basics here. In order to file a patent, a patentability study is usually a very useful thing. When you're doing a patentability study for your patent, you're actually getting to see what others are doing. So there's a value there. Another thing is patent cost uh, for filing and for maintenance fees. And so you really want to decide if you really want to get a patent because it costs money. And patenting something worldwide could cost fifty dollars or $100,000. So there is a cost to patents and it's a basic business decision. One of the things we talked about is that patents are only useful in the countries that they're filed in. You might not know this, but the patent laws are different in different countries. So it becomes a very complicated game of getting a patent in a country or multiple patents in different countries, where in every country, the laws of what that allows you to do could be very different. One of the things about patents is you do a patentability study and you go through this whole process of office actions with the examiners. So it becomes a great competitive intelligence tool. I can't tell you how many times we've been involved in the, the filing of a patent and the office actions which then provides great insight into what the competition is doing. Patentability studies also can help you by doing what's called a freedom to operate study. If you have a product, you want to know whether you're going to get sued or not, you do a freedom to operate study. That might show patents that you should worry about. So the patent system is designed for you to not only get your own patent, but to 
be able to use the patent system to know if somebody else could sue you. But most of the people that get patents will at some point, when they think that the patent is very valuable, do an evidence of use study. This study is a study by which one takes your patent claims and compares it to the product that you think might be infringing to provide an opinion as to whether your patent is strong enough. In other words, it has evidence. There are broader studies for patents, patent landscapes and patent white space, etc. But these are all part of what a patent process does to give you insight. And one of the things that we always recommend if you're going to get a patent is to sort of think about a pebble in a pond. When you invent something, basically you'll affect the ecosystem around it. So if you could imagine that you invented a new laser that assisted in bread making to brown the bread, well, you get the patent on this, but there's probably dozens of other patents in terms of the processes and the aesthetics that it produces and all sorts of new recipes. So as you're inventing and creating your first patent, if that's who you are, uh, recognize your patent generally affects many other things. And I have not ever seen one patent that couldn't be expanded to 15 or 20 patents. Let's talk about topic six, the future of patents. There is a sort of spiraling trend up that there is more and more patents all the time. We're now well over the 10 million figure in the USA alone. There's lots of money in patent litigation. In a recent case of uh, Fortress VLSI against Intel, Intel basically lost $2.2 billion for patent infringement. That's a lot of money. So you can see the value of patents by the size of the litigations. And right now there is a lot of activity and more and more litigations and bigger and bigger awards. So patents are becoming more and more valuable. We talked about M&A valuations and stock valuations. We do these all the time, several a month, and you'd be surprised how a small patent position can really raise the value of the company. Even in investment, as I mentioned, there's a lot of money going into funds that are basically securing legal rights to patents in order to litigate. So there's a lot of money pouring into patents right now. Beyond this is how AI is affecting the future of patents. You know, we could talk about that Dabas case again. But AI is now possible to write patents, and whether or not it will be the author, it doesn't really matter, right? Because it turns out that AI can help you up to 95% of the process and give you the decisions to make. You could probably make in 15 minutes to decide which way you want to go. So you become the uh, inventor and possibly owner, where the AI just does 95% of the work. So the discussion about whether the patent should be done by a human, I think is muted by the fact that you could write the AI to just augment you. There are these patent wars that, that you start to see where people are starting to develop lots of patents in a certain industry. And again, AI can help here because AI can create millions of inventions, not just 10 or 20 inventions. So we can really beef up our portfolio by using these new tools. One of the things about, about AI is even though it can't invent, as I mentioned, it could do all sorts of things to help you to augment you to be an inventor. One of the things that we've found is that AI is now being applied to chasing technology which means that when you get evidence of use and you understand whether somebody or not is violating your patent, you can use the computer to check every week. And with your, with your reading your iPad in the morning, you can see whether your patent is more or less valuable. There is very near future whereby you'll be able to put in a patent number and a computer will find the evidence of use. So really what's happening is that patents married to AI are going to show us that we have a very important combination, powerful combination. There's another sort of very interesting part about invention and that is what, you can invent something and publish it, not patent it. And when you publish something, it stops everybody else. Well, just imagine an AI system creating millions of enabled publications in a topical area. There's no requirement that publications have to be done by a human. But boy, you could create a huge prior art system using AI to publish. We haven't even talked about AI moving to quantum machines. So quantum machines actually are exponentially better than AI. So just imagine the future for that. And quantum machines are here, and they're being used. For instance, IBM Cleveland Clinic just announced a 10-year program to apply AI to medicine. Needless to say, we really have to stay tuned here because there's lots of changes in sight. But the basic idea that we go back to is that sort of might was right, muscle, those arm wrestlers. And that moved to that money added to might. But patents become the ideas that can get you to money. So ideas become powerful. And so the more stronger our patent system, the more stronger ideas can be and the ownership of, of those. And we can be augmented and accelerated with AI and quantum machines. So the patent system is going to go through lots of changes over the next several decades. So to wrap up, I talked about our first topic, the history of patents, where it all started and where we think it might head. We talked in topic two about sort of what a patent is and why it's a negative right and what it's not in topic three. Surprising to find out that a patent doesn't give you the right to make your invention. It just gives you the right to stop others. 
We talked about positive things a patent can do from you, other than the ego and the, and the big thing you get by being an inventor, that the market would love it, that investors would love it, etc. It might be adding to a significant value to your company. So in topic four, we talked about what a patent can do for you. We moved to topic five about what a patent can do for you in terms of understanding things from the patent process. The fundamental exercise of going through a patent process will give you tremendous insight about your business, the competitors, etc. And then in topic six, we sort of ended with this, what is the future of patents? Ending with quantum machines, inventing. Whether or not the human being needs to be the inventor or not, I think is a mute point. But in our future, I can certainly see AI and quantum machines being the tools we're going to use to super invent. So in our next episode, we'll cover how to get a patent on the invention. This really takes us through things about the process, about we've talked about how to enable it, but now we have to talk about how to work with our patent attorney, what to expect from the patent office, what are the trap doors that we should be looking at. Let's even talk about in this episode coming up about the statistics of where you stack up. You'd be surprised to find out of how many people actually file a patent versus how many people actually get it. And then you'd be surprised to find out what the percentage of patents are that really cover real products. So if you found this episode useful, you can support the podcast by liking the video and subscribing to YouTube. If you're listening on the Apple podcast, you can give us a five-star review if you think we deserve it, of course. And if you're interested in learning more, you can read the many articles in our blogs at ipcg.com slash blog invent anything. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you again in Invent Anything.